you talk a little bit more about your uh, research into intellectual humility, I'm pretty sure, and how you focused on uh, the vaccine and kind of the culture around like not having vaccines and the anti-vax movement and that sort of culture here. And what have you learned from that research? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I could go on an hour more about that, but I'll try to keep it very brief. I just actually gave a talk a couple of days ago at a conference on intellectual humility. Interestingly, it's so in the, in the moment that there's a whole four day conference just on intellectual humility. But uh, my angle at the moment is that people who are generally intellectually humble, that is generally they're willing to concede they don't know everything and they might their, what they think they know is subject to revision if they learn new stuff, they still have certain things that they're not humble about. They believe that, well, I may generally believe I could be wrong, but in this area, I, I'm not willing to entertain a different view. And we have taken that approach to look, and, and vaccination turns out to be one of those. And I would even say I'm a case study in that. I am generally a fairly intellectually humble guy but when it comes to vaccination, I know I'm right. And my opinion about vaccination is not subject to change, right? So you might say that I'm intellectually arrogant as it relates to uh, intellectual humility. So one thing that we've been trying to do is sort of use that as a lens to even understand how intellectual humility works, that it may not be the case that we really want people always to be more intellectually humble. We, we want them to be that way. Well, let me give you an example. When the, when the COVID vaccines were first being developed, it made sense to not reach a conclusion about their efficacy. So if you became convinced very early on, uh, I would argue that's intellectual humility of a bad sort. Uh, uh, but as we be it became more and more clear they're effective and safe and the like, then I think sort of accepting the opinion, no, this is the right, you know, it isn't perfect, but this is, I am unwilling to admit that somehow we're on the wrong path by having people get vaccinated. So in some ways it's sort of an obvious and straightforward message, but in the, out there in the field, it uh, 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 is news. And uh, so one thing we're doing, and this is some more work back with Angela Duckworth, we're working on interventions nudges, they're called small scale interventions to get people to, particularly people who are anti-vax uh, to cons consider the possibility they could be wrong. And the feeling is if they're willing to do that, the second they look at the evidence, they'll be convinced and they will uh, get the vaccine. Okay, so this is probably our last question um, before you wrap up. Um, so you talked about the different practices of research and different techniques. Uh, what is the difference between cross-sectional research and longitudinal? Longitudinal. Yeah. Um, and uh, does does the cross-sectional one outweigh the time-consuming um, when you're doing the longitudinal? Yeah. Well, let me preface it by saying. At the end of the day, what we want to do as scientists is make cause effect statements. And if that's our goal, then cross-sectional studies, uh, they're not useless at all, but they are very limited. Because we're measuring everything at the same time and only one time, we have no way of knowing what comes before what. So in other words, I can demonstrate that this is related to that, but I can't from the data, I can't make any conclusion about which one caused the other. On the other hand, as you suggest, practically speaking, I can get a lot of information quickly. For example, we've collected data now on a half a dozen COVID-related studies. There just hasn't been time to do longitudinal studies. So if I believe that's the only thing that was worth doing, we simply wouldn't have any information about COVID. But we know that over time, we need to get longitudinal data. Uh, and what that lets us do then is put things in some kind of an order. This comes before that. If this doesn't happen, that doesn't happen. So we tend to think about cross-sectional studies as the place you start. 
but then as soon as possible. And no, oh, by the way, the other option besides longitudinal studies is experiments, right? So some things, and that lets me also assert cause and effect if it's things that I can experimentally manipulate. So I first do a cross-sectional study, measure things I need to control and all that. Then using that, I either say, is this something I can do an experiment on or do I need to do a longitudinal study? Uh, and then when the, the problem of course too is it takes money to do a longitudinal study. So somebody's got to put up the cash, so to speak, to get it done. Good question though.